Hello, and welcome to the lecture for Chapter 2 of Conceptual Physical Science, 6th edition from Hewitt. In this chapter, we're going to talk about more forces, and specifically how forces work. And that is all covered under Newton's Laws of Motion. And there's three of them, by the way, three Newton's Laws. Okay, so let's get to it. We'll be talking about the first of Newton's Laws, the second, and then eventually the third. We'll talk a bit about forces and interactions, and we'll then summarize all three laws. So the big picture here is, of course, to learn the three laws, just have them at your fingertips, be able to memorize what the three laws are, and really think about what they each mean in particular situations. And we'll talk about some important caveats, some important potential pitfalls, some understanding points that some people get confused about, and so we'll dive into those a bit more. Okay? So let's get into the first of Newton's three laws, okay? Now this is the law of inertia. There it is, the law of inertia, okay? The first of the three laws. Each of the three laws, by the way, kind of has this nickname, all right? So the first one, the law of inertia. Now what's interesting is this really is like Galileo's principle of inertia. You can really think of the first law of motion as just a refinement of what we talked about in the previous lecture covering chapter one when we talked about Galileo, okay? But let's reiterate exactly how Newton phrases this law. What it states is that every object continues in a state of rest or of uniform speed in a straight line unless acted on by a non-zero force, okay? So you have to push, pull something in order for it to speed up, slow down, or turn, okay? Otherwise, objects will just continue moving in straight lines at constant speed, okay? So, let's consider a check here. A sheet of paper can be quickly withdrawn from under a soft drink can without the can toppling. Why is this? Is it because gravity pulls harder on the can than on the paper? Is it because the can has weight? Is it because the can has inertia? Or are none of these relevant? What is it that allows the can to stay there? It's inertia. It's the same idea as we talked about in the previous lecture when we talked about pulling quickly on the string of a hanging ball and having the bottom string break. Please review that example if that doesn't make sense to you. Let's do another check. If you swing a stone overhead in a horizontal circle and the string breaks, the tendency of the stone is what? So imagine, right, that you're this stick figure here. You're swinging a string. Right? right when it's directly overhead, the string breaks. What path will that stone take once the string breaks? Will it take a curved path, a straight line path? Will it spiral? Or will it take a vertical path, either straight up or straight down? It's a straight line path. Straight line path. It's the principle behind the ancient weapon, the sling. The moment it's released and there's no more tension force, because the string's broken, so the tension force is gone, then whatever is the instantaneous velocity of the stone at the moment that the string broke is the velocity that it will maintain at the moment it leaves, okay? Now, eventually, gravity will start acting on it, you know, or the, the effect of gravity will become noticeable, but the instant it breaks, it will be taking a straight line path, okay? So, what are some other examples of inertia? Because we kind of gave a couple already. Well, we talked about this one in the previous lecture. I just mentioned it. We talked about the idea of pulling a piece of paper. In this case, we could pull a piece of paper and have a coin drop into a cup, a neat trick. Here is another example. Why do the downward motion and sudden stop of the hammer handle tighten the hammerhead? Because of inertia, right? Because the hammerhead wants to keep going, right? It can't stop without any force, so it has to use the friction of the attachment of the central shaft in order to stop it, which allows it to become tightened, okay? All right, here, let's consider inertia in action, in action, okay? So we have rapid deceleration is sensed by the driver who lurches forward. You slam on the brakes, you wanna keep moving forward. Why do you wanna keep moving forward? Because of inertia, because of your own inertia. And what is inertia? Inertia is mass, remember? Inertia is measured in kilograms, okay? Since you have it, Mass, inertia, whatever you want to call it, that's why you want to keep moving when the car suddenly stops. It is also an example of Newton's second law because no force stops the driver while the brakes stop the vehicle. And we say Newton's second law, why? Well, we'll clarify what that is in just a second, but Newton's second law has to deal with the acceleration. In this case, clearly the truck 
had a very quick deceleration. Okay? All right. More inertia in action. Okay? Just more examples. When you flip a coin in a high-speed airplane, it behaves as if the airplane were at rest. Right? It's not like once you flip the coin up in the air, it's not like the, the coin flies to the back of the airplane because the airplane's moving so quickly relative to the ground. No. The coin goes up, comes right back down. Okay? That's because the coin keeps up with you. When you throw the coin, because the coin has inertia, it has the same initial velocity as the plane. It's moving with the plane. The only force that you gave it was an upward force to flick it. We'll call that the flick force. Okay? But that force was not in the direction of the velocity of the plane. And so therefore, the coin goes straight up and comes straight back down. Now, relative to the ground, that coin would have the same velocity of the plane throughout the entire toss. Okay? Another example. Can the bird drop down and catch the worm if the earth moves at 30 kilometers per second? Because I bring this up because this is the dilemma that ancient philosophers had, those that predate Galileo, like Aristotle, for example. They couldn't understand inertia because they couldn't understand that the earth was in motion. They thought the earth was at rest and the, uni the universe around us was moving. We were unique in the universe and everything moved around us. That's the geocentric model of the universe. And it made a lot of sense to people because to think that Earth is moving at 30 kilometers per second sounds ridiculous because we'd fly off, wouldn't we? But we don't fly off and neither does the bird because everything has inertia. So we don't notice that we're moving with the Earth. So of course the bird does dive right down and catch that worm, okay? All right, so enough about the first law. Let's talk about the second law of motion. This is a real workhorse of a law. This is the one that gets used the most. It is the setup for most mathematical solutions that involve forces, okay? And it is known as the law of acceleration because it really defines the relationship between force and acceleration, okay? Let's read it as a statement, and of course, we'll talk about it as an equation as well. So the law of acceleration, Newton's second law, states the following. The acceleration produced by a net force on an object is directly proportional, directly proportional to the net force, okay? Is in the same direction as the net force and is inversely proportional to the mass of the object, okay? So if you're not familiar with proportionalities, it just means if one goes up, the other also goes up. So the idea is if force is directly proportional, there's the symbol for proportional, to acceleration, that means if I increase force, then I must also increase acceleration. If I was to decrease force, acceleration would also decrease. That's what direct proportionalities mean. On the other hand, this idea of an inverse proportionality means that force is inversely proportional to mass. So in that case, we would write mass to the negative one power to denote the inverse. That means that if the force goes up, then mass goes down. Another way to write mass to the negative one power is simply mass in the denominator of a fraction, one over m. But in exponent form, m to the negative one is the same as one over m, okay? So that's what those terms inversely proportional and proportional mean, okay? So there's some intuition behind this. We know that if you push on something harder, it moves more. That's essentially what Newton's second law is saying. So for example, the force of, of the hand here accelerates the brick, okay? We're speeding up the brick. And if we apply twice as much force, then we get twice as much acceleration. We speed it up twice as fast. We push, if we push harder, it speeds up faster. That is exactly what we would expect, right? And if we have twice the force, but we were to double the bricks, well, then it actually would have the same acceleration as the first case. Because trying to speed up something that's heavier is harder. So in that case, doubling the force just achieved the result of having the same as the original acceleration when there was just one brick. Okay, so in equation form, it states acceleration, and that's acceleration with units of meters per second squared, equals net force over mass. Net force is measured in newtons, mass is measured in kilograms. In symbolic form, it's A for acceleration equals F over M. Now, an important thing is that this is F net, so sometimes it's good to actually write that subscript net. And remember, the net force is the sum of all forces. So net force would be like F1 
plus F2, etc. And please review the previous lecture from the previous chapter to recall what exactly a net force is. But it's just the sum of individual forces. Because if you ever want to relate the acceleration to forces, it has to be the net force. If you ignore any one force, you're not going to get the true acceleration. Okay? All right. So a small net force and a large mass means a small acceleration. On the other hand, a large net force and a small mass means a lot of acceleration. Okay? Makes sense. So let's consider some examples, some checks. Consider a cart pushed along a track with a certain force. If the force remains the same, while the mass of the cart decreases, so the cart becomes lighter, right, less atoms, so to half its original mass, the acceleration of the cart would do what? Remain the same, cut in half, double, or change unpredictably, right? That's probably not a good answer. There should be a way to predict things. That's what the physical sciences are all about. So which one is it? Force remain the same, but we cut the mass in half. Think about that inverse proportionality. Think about the fact that the force is proportional to one over m, all right? And the force is directly proportional to the acceleration, which means that the force remained constant, then the acceleration is proportional to one over m. See it? It doubles, because it's easier to speed something up that's lighter. And that's what we did here. We cut its weight in half. Okay, technically we cut its mass in half, but as long as we stay on Earth, then we could say mass and weight reduction are the same. Okay, remember weight only changes if you change from one world to another. Okay, another check. Push a cart along a track, so twice as much net force acts upon it. If the acceleration remains the same, what is a reasonable ex explanation of what happened? Okay, so you're pushing a cart along a track, and twice as much net force acts upon it. Okay, does that mean that the mass of the cart doubled when the force doubled? that the cart experienced a force that it didn't before, that the track is not level, that friction reversed direction, which is the most reasonable explanation? It's simply the mass doubling, all right? At the moment that you doubled the force, someone was pouring in extra weights into that cart. And so the result was that by the time you had finished doubling the force, the mass had already doubled, so the acceleration remained unchanged, okay? Okay, so a special case and a very important case of Newton's second law applies to the very important case of gravity. Why? Because gravity surrounds us. It's such a relevant force for living on a planet like Earth. Okay? Okay. So, when acceleration is g, which we call free fall acceleration or gravitational acceleration, and g on Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? That's the value on Earth to about two significant figures. We can round that value to 10 in some cases. Okay, but unless you're told to round it to 10, use 9.8. When the only force acting on a falling object is gravity, when ne with negligible air resistance, okay, we'll talk more about air resistance later, but here we can ignore it. And for large objects, that's fair to ignore it because the air resistance would be much smaller than the gravitational force. Then we say the object is in free fall. We talked about free fall before when we were understanding the relationships between distance, velocity, and acceleration briefly at the end of the previous chapter. Okay? But here we're talking about the forces of free fall. So an object and accelerations. An object in free fall accelerates towards Earth at 10 meters per second per second. Okay? So 10 meters per second squared is the approximation. Okay? 9.8 is, 9 is better. Okay. But using the approximation of 10, at one instant, an object in free fall has a speed of 40 meters per second. Its speed one second later is what? This is review from the previous chapter. Which is it? Okay, you should know it's 50, 50 meters per second. Okay, so when the acceleration g, free fall acceleration, how does that relate to forces? Well, twice the force on twice the mass means the same acceleration is half the force and half the mass. And here's the thing we just said that everything accelerates at the same rate. That means that every single object experiences a different force. The way I think about it is, you know, consider these two blocks here, m and 2m, so something that has twice as much mass. You can consider an adult and a child, an adult that has twice as much mass as a child. But if we both jump off the edge of a diving board and, and jump into a pool, we'll both accelerate down at the same rate. We both have the same downward acceleration, g. That means that we must have both experienced, here's, and this is, again, the way I think of it, tailor-made forces for us. It's like, it's like Earth is out there customizing the gravitational pull on everybody, so we all achieve the same acceleration. 
It's kind of a neat idea. It's like gravity is, is specialized or pre-selected for you. Of course, there's a good reason for that. We'll talk about that when we talk about the, the law of universal gravitation, which is separate from the laws of motion that we're talking about in this chapter. But that's really the way gravity works. Acceleration is universal, but forces are individual. Okay? All right. And that's the only way for this to work. Right? That's, that's the reality of physics, even though it might not be your initial guess. You might think that maybe Earth pulls on everything with the same force. No. Earth pulls on everything with unique forces. It's just the acceleration that's shared. Okay? All right. So a 5-kilogram iron ball and a 10-kilogram iron ball are dropped from rest. Okay? For negligible air resistance, the acceleration of the heavier ball will be less than the light ball, the same as the light ball, more, or undetermined. Well, which is it? got to be the same because acceleration is always the same okay okay now a five kilogram iron ball and a 10 kilogram iron ball are dropped from rest when the free falling five kilogram iron ball reaches a speed of 10 meters per second the speed of the free falling 10 kilogram iron ball is what okay so you, they both started from rest we dropped them together once one of them is sped up to 10 meters per second what has the other one sped up to the heavier one which would it be? Would it be less than 10 meters per second? All right, because it's heavier. The same, more, or undetermined? The same, the same, because the same acceleration. The same acceleration means that they're both speeding up at 10 meters per second per second. So after four seconds, they'd both be following at 40 meters per second. Okay, since they share accelerations, they share the instantaneous velocity after a certain amount of time because they both started at rest at the same time. Okay, all right, but remember, they don't share the force. Okay, let's even write that down. But they, that's the five and the 10 kilogram iron balls, do not share force. In fact, the force that the 10 kilogram and the five kilogram would experience are the following. So 10, five and 10, okay, so we know it's gonna be MA, Okay, we'll call this M5 and M10. Okay, we'll use the approximation. So in this case, I would just have five kilograms times 10 meters per second squared. Over here, I'm gonna have 10 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared. So then you see that in this case, there's 50 newtons of gravitational force acting on the five kilogram iron ball and 100 newtons of gravitational force acting on the heavier 10 kilogram iron ball. Okay, so they have different forces acting on them, but the same acceleration. Okay, I know I've said that a few times, but it's an important idea, and hopefully it's sunk in. So, when acceleration is g, the ratio of weight to mass is the same for all falling objects in the same locality, all on Earth, right? Hence, their accelerations are the same in the absence of air resistance. Okay, this is just putting into pictorial form what we've been talking about. Right? This idea of having equal ratios is similar, if you're wondering why there's a circle and the symbol pi, is similar to the idea of having equal ratio, ratios between circumference, c, and diameter, d. Because, of course, that's the definition of pi, the ratio of circumference over diameter. That's where you get pi as 3.14, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? a number that never ends. Okay, Same idea here. The ratio is always the same. It's just that it gives us a value that isn't as mathematically universal is pi. That's a, that's a, a constant of the universe. Here, 9.8 is just a value that's unique to Earth, so very important to humans, but again, just a reality of our particular planet for this particular solar system, right? There are you know, trillions of other planets out there that, of course, behave differently. Okay? So, when acceleration is g, free fall, all right, demonstration of a feather and a coin in a vacuum, they would both fall at the same rate. That's like Galileo's way of presenting the idea of universal acceleration, the idea of presenting inertia. In a vacuum, a feather and a coin fall together at G, the acceleration due to gravity. Now, in a non-vacuum, the feather falls much slower because it has such significant air resistance compared to its weight, okay? So when an air-filled glass tube containing a coin and a feather is inverted, the coin falls quickly to the bottom of the tube while the feather flutters to the bottom, okay? Because of all that air resistance. When the air is removed by a vacuum pump and the activity is repeated, we know the result. They hit at the same time side by side because their accelerations were independent of their masses. And they may have even had the same masses. 
the coin and the feather could have literally both been two grams or something, right? They could have both had the same mass, but just having different air resistance values, air resistance being a force, the force of air resistance, would cause them to have different accelerations because they would have different F nets, different net forces acting on them. But once we remove air resistance, then they have the same net force, all right, if they have the same weight. And even if they don't have the same weight, then they're still gonna have the same acceleration because they will have a custom made gravitational force. Pretty interesting, okay? So when acceleration is less than G, that's because there is air resistance. And there are lots of times air resistance is incredibly important. If you care about fluttering feathers, or if you wanna find out how to parachute, then you care a lot about the air resistance force, okay? And that's represented here. We call this force of drag, right? Represented by an arrow because it's a vector. Okay, so non-free fall occurs when two forces act on a falling object. Two forces, so F net here, would be the sum of the drag force plus the gravity force, all right? A force due to gravity acting downwards, which we call weight, because the gravitational force and the weight are synonyms, two ways of saying the same thing, okay? And a force acting upwards, which is the air resistance or drag force. So. When a 20 Newton falling object encounters 5 Newtons of air resistance, its acceleration of fall is what? Less than G? More than G? Exactly G? Or terminated? Just no acceleration at all. It's less than G. Okay? It would have some value less than G. In fact, we can calculate that value. The acceleration would be 20 minus 5 divided by 2 equals 7.5. Where do we get that from? Well, we got that net force is 20 newtons, because that's the gravitational force, minus the five newtons of upward drag force, okay? Because we wanna care about the acceleration in the downward direction, which is why we're subtracting any upward forces, okay? And then we remember that F net equals MA, so then if I algebraically solve for A, then I get that I have F net divided by M. Well, I already know my F net is 15, I divide 15 by two, and that gives me my 17.5. We could write that in units of newtons per kilogram or meters per second squared. They're the same, they mean the same thing. Certainly this is the more typical one. Okay, so that's a way to actually do one of these calculations using, using Newton's second law. So when acceleration is less than G, a non-free fall situation like parachuting, well, that applies to falling objects that gain speed and then the force exerted by the surrounding air increases, okay? So at first, you're at rest. Consider jumping out of an airplane. At first, you're at rest, right? At least in the vertical direction. You speed up at first, okay? But then as you speed up, air resistance increases. Why is that? That's because air resistance is proportional to speed. So the drag force, that air resistance, is proportional to how fast you're moving. As you speed up, you get more and more air resistance. This is the way that, that fluid drag forces work because all those molecules of the air rushing past you, well, as you rush more and more of them past you, as you speed up, they have a bigger and bigger effect on slowing you down, okay? So the force of air resistance may continue to increase until it equals the weight, until it equals the weight. Then you're in an equilibrium. You would be no longer speeding up or slowing down. You would be in dynamic equilibrium, which is a term we presented in chapter one dynamic equilibrium. At this point, net force is zero and no further acceleration, okay? The object has reached terminal velocity. So dynamic equilibrium, in the particular case of non-free fall, like parachuting, is a, applies to the term terminal velocity, all right? A term you may have, heard, may have heard before, okay? And you continue falling at that constant velocity with no more acceleration. Now, the terminal velocity of a human without a parachute is... I think it's around 80 or 90 meters per second, you know, so that, that's like before they open the parachute, they're, they're whizzing down at high speed. It's not infinite because they do have, they, you know, they have some drag themselves, just the human body presents air resistance. Once you open that parachute, your terminal velocity is much, much slower, which is good because it's slow enough you can land at that terminal velocity and not hurt yourself, okay? So if a 50 Newton person is to fall at terminal speed, the air resistance needed is what? Terminal speed requires equilibrium, requires a balance of forces. So that means your air resistance needs to be exactly 50 newtons because you have to have a sum of forces or F net, whatever you want to call it, equal to zero. Okay, this has to be true. 
in order for the acceleration to equal zero, which is what you need to have a terminal speed, okay? So as the skydiver falls faster and faster through air, air resistance does what? I told you this one a minute ago. Make sure you can answer it. It increases, okay? Because air resistance that is a particular force that is proportional to velocity. By the way, friction is not. Friction is independent of velocity. Air resistance is dependent and proportional to velocity, okay? As the skydiver continues to fall faster and faster through the air, the net force does what? Net force. The air resistance goes up, gravity remains unchanged, they're pointing in opposite directions, which means the net force is approaching zero, which means it decreases, okay? So, as a, sky, as a skydiver continues to fall faster and faster to the air, her acceleration, well, we know that the net force was decreasing, and we know the net force is directly proportional to acceleration, so, yep, the acceleration is also decreasing, because eventually you reach terminal velocity where there's no acceleration at all. Okay, so cons consider a heavy and light person with the same size parachutes jumping together from the same altitude. Okay, who will reach the ground first? The light person, the heavy person, both at the same time, or not enough information? What do you think? Who will hit the ground first? It's the heavy person. The heavy person has a greater terminal velocity. That's because the air resistance has to be greater in order to balance out their greater gravitational force. And since air resistance is proportional to the velocity, that means their terminal velocity is greater. The heavier person has a greater terminal velocity. Okay? All from F net equals zero. Okay? All right. So before we cover Newton's third law, we want to talk about some ideas to lay the groundwork of it, which is forces and interactions just to make sure we're all speaking the same language. Okay, so force is simply a push or a pull. That's how we defined it in chapter one. And that's still an absolutely good definition. An interaction occurs between one thing and another. Okay, so what is an interaction? Let's define that carefully. Example, when you push against a wall, you're interacting with the wall. You apply a push to the wall. The interaction is between you and the wall. Okay, so. With that definition out of the way, let's then think about what Newton's third law is all about, because it's all about those interactions. So it says the following, the third law. It's the law of actions and reactions, okay? So whenever one object exerts a force on a second object, right, so an interaction between the two, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. And when we say opposite, what we mean, since force has direction and value, we mean opposite direction. That's always what we mean by opposite. So if I push on the wall, right? So if I apply a pushing force, F push, then the wall pushes back on me with the same exact force in value, same number of Newtons of, of force, right? But back towards me. And we'll call this one the normal force, okay? I push on the wall, the wall pushes back, okay? Now, those two forces are exactly equal as long as the wall remains at rest because that would give me an F net equals zero, which means that the acceleration is equal to zero. And obviously we assume walls remain at rest. If this was something that did move, like if I was pushing on a small car and I started pushing it along, well, in that case, the car would not be pushing back as much as I'm pushing on the wall. We'd have an imbalance of forces that would allow for an acceleration, okay? But for things that remain at rest, they're exactly equal and opposite, okay? Now, what's interesting is that the force that I push back on will always be equal. So the case of the rolling car, it's then it's the another force pair between the ground and the car's wheels that allow the car to start moving. Because even if the car is moving and I push on it, it's still going to push back with the same force. Okay? So when your hand presses on the wall, the wall simultaneously presses on your hand. The hand and the wall press on each other with equal and opposite forces. Okay? And that's an idea sometimes people struggle with because they don't think about inert objects like floors and walls being able to push, but of course they can, because how else would you stand on them or lean against them, okay? So an action and reaction forces. One force is called the action force. It's an arbitrary choice. It's usually the one that comes from the, the human or the machine, okay? The other is called the reaction force. They are co-pairs 
of a single interaction. They create a force pair. All right, force pair. Neither force exists without, with, exists without the other. You can never just have a force without a pair, ever, okay? They're equal in strength and opposite in direction, and they always act on different objects. It's important because when we talk about tensions, a rope has forces at either end, a tension force. Those forces also tend to be equal and opposite, but they both act on the same rope, so they do not represent a force pair, nor do they apply to Newton's third law. You have to have two separate objects, like the person and the wall. This would be a valid example, which is good because it's the example we chose. Okay? So let's do a check here. Soccer player kicks a ball with a 1,500 Newton force, which is a really strong force. The ball exerts a reaction force against the player's foot of how much? Right? Because the ball goes flying off in the air. Does that mean the ball doesn't push his back as much? So somewhat less, exactly equal, somewhat more, none of the above. Exactly equal. The force on the ball has to be the same as the force on the foot, okay? They have to be opposite and equal. So the simple rule to identify actions and reactions, the action, object A exerts a force on object B, the reaction, object B exerts a force on object A. So we got lots of examples, I'm gonna zoom in a bit on these. We got the example of the car, which I mentioned in passing when I said you push on a car and it starts to move, there's a, an, a force pair, an action and reaction between the car's tires and the ground. Well, here's an example of actually using that to push a car along. So the, the tire pushes on the road, it pushes off from the road, which causes the road to push on the tire, which then keeps the car moving, of course, gives it some velocity, okay? Now, what about a rocket? Well, in the case of a rocket, the rocket pushes on the gas. So it actually pushes off of the gas. That means the gas pushes on the rocket, which of course then allows the rocket to get propelled up into the air, okay? We could have a person pulling on a spring, in that case, the spring pulls back on the person. We could have earth pulling on a ball and the ball pulling back on earth. Yes, really. Every time you drop something and you see, fall, so you see it fall through the air, that falling something is pulling up on the earth. Every time you yourself jump in the air, as you're airborne, what's the other half of the force that's pulling you back to the ground? You pulling on earth, honestly. And does that mean since you're pulling on earth that you're causing earth to accelerate? Yes. But you're causing Earth to accelerate on the order of one of 0 0.20 zeros and then a one. So the, the amount of acceleration that, the, that a single person would cause the Earth to experience would be absolutely impossible to measure because it would be on the, the one billionth of a trillionth of a meter per second squared. Okay? Which makes sense because in, you know, any of it, small weights, individual per people, should not be able to accelerate something as large as the planet, right? So, when you step up a curb, Earth pulls you downwards, the reaction of this force is, you know it, I was just talking about it, you pull up on the Earth, okay? Really. Now, of course, you know, if we think about a larger object like the moon, then the pull between the Earth and the moon becomes more prevalent. The moon clearly pulls on Earth, just like the Earth pulls on the moon, because we have tides. We see the pull of the moon. It's, it's noticeable, okay? All right, that's because the moon's awfully large. So, actions and reactions on different masses. If the same force is applied to two objects of different mass, then the greater mass object has a small acceleration and the smaller mass object has a large acceleration, okay? So that means that you can have a force pair that results in the, yes, the same force, because they must share the force, but different accelerations. This is highlighted very well by a cannon and a cannonball, because clearly the cannon, right, this whole big object here, is much, much more massive than the cannonball, right? Okay, so when a cannon is fired, the acceleration of the cannon and the cannonball are different because, why are they different? Because the forces don't occur at the same time, because the forces, although theoretically the same, in practice aren't the same, is that what makes, you know, it's because clearly the ball is gonna go faster than the cannon, because the masses are different, or because the ratio of forces to mass are the same. It's because the masses are different. They both experience the same force. The force that the, the, the cannon exerts on the cannonball is the same as the reaction force that the cannonball exerts on the cannon. Same force. But the acceleration, the recoil acceleration of the cannon would be small because the mass of the cannon is large 
Whereas the forward acceleration of the ball is very large because its mass is small. Okay? What are we doing there? Well, we're combining Newton's third law, the fact that they share equal forces, with Newton's second law to relate the mass to the acceleration. Okay? So same force, different accelerations because different masses. Okay? And that's actually very common to combine Newton's third law with Newton's second law like that. Okay? So consider a situation. Ponder a situation. A high-speed bus colliding head-on with an innocent bug. The force of impact splatters the unfortunate bug all over the windshield. Okay? Which is greater, the force on the bug or the force on the bus? Well, it's got to be the bug, right? Nope. They're the same. Although the forces are equal in magnitude, truly and honestly equal in magnitude, the effects are very different. Very, very different. Why is that? I won't tell you, but it's... The ideas we've already been thinking about. Think about how you would phrase that for yourself. Why are they different? How would you explain why the effects are so different? Why the bus just continues on as if nothing happened and the bug is completely liquefied? Okay? So two people of equal mass on slippery ice push off from each other. Will both move on the, at the same speed in opposite directions? Well, they have equal mass. They're pushing off of each other. So yes. Okay? However they push. One person could just do all the pushing. They could both push. It wouldn't matter. The results would always be equal magnitude forces. We would just look for F net, and they'd both experience that same F net. Okay? So, an important thing to consider before we wrap up this lecture is the idea of a system. It's really crucial for making sure that you use Newton's third law correctly, and it's really crucial for using forces in general correctly, which applies to so much of the other physical sciences. So this idea of a system is just an important aside that we need to spend a moment on. And to do that, we're going to consider a cartoon orange. Okay, so consider a single enclosed orange. It's enclosed represented by this dashed line here. Okay, so in this case, there's an external force, all right, that causes the orange to accelerate in accord with Newton's second law. The action and reaction pair of forces is not shown. Okay, and that's totally, totally allowed. You don't always have to show the reaction to an action. There are plenty of real life situations where there's a force and you don't really care about the other, the other half of the force pair. You just care about the effect of that external force. And that's why we call it external because it's external to the system. Okay? Okay. So that means that this orange is accelerating. Okay. Well, now let's change our system. Okay? So consider the orange and the apple pulling on it. In this case, the action and reaction do not cancel because they're acting on different things. The external force by the apple accelerates the orange, accelerates the orange relative to the ground. Okay, but now if we include the apple in the system, now is there acceleration between the apple and the orange? Well, let's consider. The apple now is no longer external to the system. We've expanded our consideration of the system, which is fine. Okay, the force pair is now internal within the system, which doesn't cause an acceleration. Our frame of reference, our system, doesn't have an internal acceleration anymore. Of course not, because the orange here would be moving with the apple. Okay, the action and the reaction within the system cancel out. F net equals zero for our system. Before, F net did not equal zero, because our system was just the orange, see? But now our system is the orange and the apple. With no external force, see, not at all, there's no acceleration. This would be a constant velocity system. The apple is just steadily pulling the orange and they're both moving along at constant velocity, which, yeah, that's kind of what you might expect when giant cartoon fruit are walking down the street. So now let's consider, consider the same system, but let's include friction. Because after all, there would be friction, wouldn't there? Okay, and friction would be external. So we have the same internal action and reaction force, the pull of the apple on the cart with the orange in it, and then the cart pulling back on the apple. Okay, so between the orange and the apple. A second pair of action reaction forces between the apple's feet and the floor also exist. See, one of these acts by the system, apple on the floor, and the other acts on the system, the floor on the apple. See. The external friction force of the floor pushes on the system, which accelerates it. 
So now we see that the system, including the orange and the apple, is accelerating relative to the ground. All right? This second pair of action reaction forces do not cancel. Okay. So when lift equals the weight of a helicopter, the helicopter does what? All right? Think about the system here. Think about the system. The lift equals the weight, the helicopter hovers. It has a net force of zero. The system of the air and the helicopter, there's no acceleration between the two. When lift is greater, the helicopter helicopter would, and we have a greater lift force, climbs. It accelerates, okay? A bird flies by, is it the flapping? Is it the pushing air down so the air pushes it upward? Is it hovering in midair? Is it the inhaling and exhaling of air? Of air? Well, it's B. Because the bird pushes on the air, the air pushes back, just like the rocket pushed on the gas and the gas pushed back, that keeps the bird airborne. Slightly tilted wings of airplanes deflect oncoming air downward to produce lift, oncoming air upward to produce lift. Both of those or neither of them? Which one? Which way would you want to deflect the air in order to produce lift? downwards because you push the air down the air pushes back and it pushes you up that's how you you fly with steady wings like a soaring bird or any airplane okay and flapping is similar but slightly different so compared with a lightweight glider a heavier glider would have to push air think about it downward with greater force down with the same force down with less force greater because it needs then to have a greater push back to keep it from falling out of the sky. It means heavier airplanes have to generate more lift. Okay? All right. So there we are with our introduction of Newton's three laws. I hope they make a lot more sense than they did when we started this lecture. Thank you so much for listening. Bye for now.